can be seated. We welcome you today. Uh, thank you. Wow, that baptism, how wow, just powerful what the Lord's doing. And, and thank you for being here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'd love the opportunity to. And also everybody joining us online. Can we give a hand to those joining us online? Thank you so much. Wherever you're watching from, thank you for being here today. It really is an honor to have you here. It really is an honor. If you have your Bible, open with me to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 is where we're going to be uh, this morning. And you can also follow along with the digital message notes as well. Just point, point your phone at the screen, your camera at the screen, and you can uh, follow along with the message. It'll have all the scriptures and points uh, for the message. But I'm so glad you're here. And as you're turning there, uh, next Sunday we're having our uh, first West Campus interest meeting at 1 o'clock in the North Auditorium. So if you are from the West, um, if, if you're from the West and you're interested in finding out more information, please please go ahead and sign up so that we can know that you're going to be there, uh, so that we can be uh, prepared for you uh, in the, at the interest meeting. And, and our hope and prayer with it is that we can help free up seats um, so that um, pe- more people can come, come to Christ. So thank you so much for... Uh, I, I've heard so many people just being so excited and just open to the new challenge. And, and uh, that was, I, every time I hear those stories, like, yeah, that's, that's, that's City Hills. That's, that's, that's what I've come to, to know and love about uh, the, you, about this amazing church family is uh, whatever. We, we never stop growing and innovating. And so thank you so much for being part of that. It's going to be a great, great time. So that's next Sunday at 1 p.m. if you'd like more information about that. And just so glad that you're here today. Well, uh, I'm loving studying uh, Romans together. So if you have your Bible, Romans chapter 6, and we're going to dig right into uh, the scripture today. It says this, uh, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Can we read that next, um, those next few words together? Verse 2, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So I've titled this message today, I am dead to sin. Could you say that with me? I am dead to sin. And I, I, that's what I've loved about this, uh, this, this series as we've studied Romans is it's really all about our identity in Christ. And uh, what Paul teaches us in Romans chapter 6 is life-changing. It's, I'll be honest, it's been life-changing for me just studying this topic and looking into it because there's so many wrong ideas about what it means to, to live without sin, what it means to actually live for Jesus. So we're going to look today and ask God. But, but here's what I know, um, that, that the Holy Spirit can speak much, <laughs> he can speak greater than I could ever speak. So well, let's just pray together and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts today individually so that we would be able to hear his word because I really think today is a powerful, powerful message uh, that, we need, that we all need to get and receive into our hearts today. So let's, let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much uh, for your word. Thank you, uh, Jesus, that you have uh, made a way for us to live in victory. And so speak to us from your word today, Holy Spirit. Lord, have your way. That's what we want. I, want. I want you to speak to our hearts and lives today. We're open. We're ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, for all the, all the parents in the house, I know not everybody is a, is a parent, but uh, one of the things that's funny about being a parent is, I was thinking about this, I find myself now saying things that my parents used to say Whenever I was a kid, and I thought to myself, I will never say that someday. <laughs> Specifically, I was thinking about a few years ago, we were headed down to Florida on vacation, and all the kids are in the back, and, and I mean, if you have small kids, you know the ordeal that it is to go on a trip, all the things that you've gotten ready to that point to get, to get on the road, and, and of course, it's WrestleMania three in the back of our minivan, I mean, it's... We're not even to Chattanooga yet, and it's, it's already bad. I mean, we're, we're, everybody's wrestling, all those kind of things. And, and it gets to the point where I say something that I heard my parents say over me, and I, I, I made this statement. I said, if you guys don't stop fighting, here's what I said, I'm going to turn this car around. Anybody ever hear your parents say that over you? Yeah. I'm going to turn this car around. And I, I mean, I, I just said it with every bit of force that I knew how to say it, trying to put the fear of God in, in, into, into my boys. And, 
And I, anyway, so I thought, you know, for effect, it was, a, you know, I thought I'd really said something. And then I look over at my wife, and she says to me under her breath, no, you will not. <laughs> She's like, I've been looking forward to this vacation too long. <laughs> we are not turning this car around. We'd already paid for the hotel. We've already booked all. We were, had restaurants we were ready to go to. She was like, you are not turning this car around. And, and I was thinking about how, uh, you know, there are moments in our journey with Jesus that are just the same. We, we, we have to make the decision. We're going to keep going. Are we going to go backwards? Are we going to go forward? Or are we going to go backward? And that's what Paul's talking about here in Romans chapter 6. He is teaching us up to this point in Romans, if you've been tracking with us, if you've missed any of the series of Romans, they're all online. You can, you can jump right in and, and, and catch up as we've studied Romans together. But one of the things that's just been so amazing as Paul has talked to us about what it means to be a follower of Jesus is he's talked about being justified by faith. In other words, we are saved, we are forgiven, and we've received the righteousness of Jesus Christ when we believed. It's, it's an amazing, amazing truth. Because a lot of times in religion, people are still trying to work to be saved. It's like, okay, you have Jesus, you've been forgiven, but you still have to work your way to heaven. And so God's grace is really only as good as you are. Because when you start making mistakes, God's grace leaves your life. But what Paul says is completely different. You've been forgiven past, present, and future. You've received the righteousness of Christ. If you missed last week, that, that, that one verse, uh, Romans five seventeen, talks about reigning in life, those of us who have received an uh, abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. It's an amazing, amazing truth. But there were people, when Paul started talking about the grace of God and all these things, there were people that, that, that didn't like what Paul was saying because they thought Paul was saying, well, then it doesn't matter how you live. So Paul starts talking to us in Romans chapter 6 about this idea of, okay, if we received all this from Jesus, if we have the righteousness of God by faith, if we have an abundance of grace that's never going away, that God's with us, we're now children of God, and we have hope of heaven, then, then how do we live in this life? Because some people uh, apparently saw Paul's teaching as an excuse to live however they wanted to live. You're taking notes. Here's what Paul was trying to say is that grace is not permission to sin, but it's power to live free. Grace is not just permission to sin, which is what some people were accusing Paul of saying. Well, if you're just under the grace of God, it shouldn't matter how you live. And some believers can live that way today. Well, I'm going to heaven. I'll ask for forgiveness instead of permission. No big deal. And, and what Paul is saying, if that's your attitude toward the Lord, you've really missed the whole point of what it's all about. Because grace is not permission to sin. It's the power to live free. But the problem is we don't always live free. And that's what Paul's about to talk to us for the next couple chapters about. See, Romans is so powerful because the first part talks about our biggest need, which is salvation. We're, we're, we're without Jesus, we're, we're sinners that need to be saved, but because of Jesus, we've been saved, we've been justified. But now Romans is going to talk to us, okay, how do, we, how do we change? And that's where a lot of us live. That's where I live so many times. It's like, Lord, I know what you've called me to do, but Lord, how do I... How do I how does that really happen in real life? Um, and, and so this is what I think this cycle, what it looks like. I have, I have a graphic that shows a little bit of a cycle of, of how we live for God so many times. We have good intentions. We come to church. We get excited. Okay, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do everything that I can do. And then we fail. After we fail, we have guilt. Then we have shame. And then we just just a cycle. And in the cycle, there's so many lies that come in our hearts and minds. Do I even love God? Does God even love me? Um, am I even saved? How do I break this cycle? And that's what we're going to talk about today. I want to share three strategies for battling sin in our lives. And sin is just means to miss the mark. It means that God has an ideal way that our lives are supposed to go. It's not God trying to keep something good from us. It's actually God being the manufacturer, knowing how we're supposed to operate. It's like, it's like whenever you buy a new car, you get an owner's manual that I don't know about you, I don't always read. 
but stays in the glove box. But see, I could have the attitude whenever I get a new car to say, it's my car, I own it, I have the deed, it's, it's mine. I don't need anybody to tell me how much oil goes in it. I don't need anybody to tell me how much, how, how, you know, if I use uh, you know, gas or if I use diesel fuel, it's my car, I can do whatever I want to do, it's my life, it's my car. Look, it's me, I have free, uh, I, you know, I, I have freedom to do whatever I want to do. And you do. But you're going to end up on the side of the road if you don't listen to the manual. Anything that's not in the manufacturer's design is sin. But the hard thing about it, and we're going to look at it at length in this series, is that what do you do whenever you know things that you shouldn't do, but you do them anyway? Anybody ever done that before? There are things that you know you shouldn't have said that, but you said it anyways. And it felt good when you said it to them, you know. You, and you're thinking, oh, how do I break this cycle? And the way Paul's going to go about breaking the cycle is so different than how I was ever taught about how we actually break out of the cycle of sin and actually change in our lives. And it's so awesome. It's so just revelatory for me. And I want to share, okay, we're just going to walk through this text together. Here's the first um, strategy of battling sin. Yeah, number one, remember your address. <laughs> remember your address. You're like, okay, I think I got that one, Brandon. I can remember my address. So here's what I mean, here's what I mean by that. Romans chapter six, we read verse one. Verse two, it says this, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Here's what the message paraphrase of, says of that. If we've, it says this, if we've left the country, See if I have that. Where sin is sovereign, how can we still live in our old house there? Or didn't you realize we packed up and we left there for good? What Paul's saying there, first of all, is that we're no longer in sin. We don't live there anymore. I had an, have you ever went back to an old house where you used to live? Maybe when, like whenever you were a child. A few years ago, I got to go back to the house that I grew up in until I was, um, until I was five years old. And in my mind, that house was a mansion. It was so big. I could ride bicycles all through the living room. Had a kitchen that was just massive. I, I just remember the stairs being so tall. And a few years ago, my wife and I were back in my hometown, and we drove past that house. And I was telling her all about it and the house and what it looked like. And when we pulled up to the house, it was a beautiful house. But it was nowhere as big as it was in my mind. What I realized is that it was a mansion in my memory. But it wasn't in reality. And the only difference was, is me. The house had not shrunk. I had just gotten bigger. I was seeing that house from a five-year-old's perspective. And what Paul is trying to say is that if you don't watch it, your spirit has been redeemed by Jesus, but your body and your mind still remembers where you used to live. You don't live in sin anymore. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are righteous. You've received an abundance of grace. And what Paul says, the first way that we battle sin in our lives is we remember that Jesus Christ took us out of that old place that we used to live in sin in Adam. We talked about that last week. And now we're in Christ Jesus. So we're no longer, we don't live. So in other words, when sin knocks on our door, we need to remind ourselves wrong address. We need to look at sin and say, return to sender. I don't live there anymore. As a matter of fact, it would be illegal for me to try to live back in that old house. If I went and just open the door, sit on the couch. Hi. I used to live here. Whoever lives there now would say, I don't care who you, where you used to live. Get out of our house. And, and, and Satan wants you living in a place you don't live anymore. Satan wants you living in an addiction where you, you've been redeemed from that addiction. 
Satan wants you living in an old mindset from where you grew up. He wants you seeing things. See, that's what happens whenever we're children. That's what happens when we're young. There are wounds that the enemy capitalizes on and we stay with mansions in our mind and we forget that, you know what, that may have been who we used to be, but that's not where we live anymore. We've been redeemed. We've been set free. We have an abundance of grace. We have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, Paul's method for how we change is not giving us the list of rules and do's and don'ts. The way that we change is through understanding our identity in Jesus Christ. Getting a revelation of our address. We're, we're, we're in Christ. The Israelites, they struggled with this in the Old Testament. God delivered them out of Egypt where they were slaves for 400 years. And after God delivered them, He brought the plagues on Egypt. They walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. Maybe you've heard the story before. After they left Egypt and they were on their way to God's promised land, to Canaan's land, it says this in Exodus chapter 16 in verse 3. It says this, If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt, they moaned. Watch, Watch their memory of Egypt. There we sat around pots filled with meat, And ate all the bread we wanted. But now you brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. If you know the story of what happened, if we could put that back up there, where is the lie? Where is their memory messed up? There we did what? We sat around pots filled with meat and ate bread, ate all the bread we wanted. One of the things they strategically forgot was that they were slaves. It's the same in our lives. We remember the past incorrectly. Satan wants us to build up all these things that are not true. And here's the truth. You've got to manage your memories if you're going to live in freedom. You, you can't just let anything that comes in your mind say, okay, that's how it used to be. No, no. You were a slave to sin. You, you are a slave to sin, but Jesus Christ set you free. He crossed, he crossed the Red Sea. He brought the plagues of Egypt. He has delivered you by the blood of the Lamb, literally. And he would say, you're remembering Egypt incorrectly, but you don't live in Egypt anymore. You're on your way to the promised land. And I say that to us as believers. We don't live in Egypt anymore. So where do we live? We talked about it last week, in Christ. Verse 3 of Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So we see, we see, he's, he's bring, using the illustration of baptism that we just got to see in this service. That was so awesome to see. Baptism is a picture of what we, what we do when we come to Jesus Christ. That we go under the water just like someone would be buried in the ground. But watch this, verse 4. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. (laughs) So so we may walk in newness of life because we've been united with Jesus Christ. Verse 5. For we have been united... For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. This is powerful. Because in Christ, we talked about it last week, you can either be one of two things. You can either be in Adam or you can be in Jesus, in Christ. In Adam, we're victims. In Adam, we're full of worry. In Adam, we're full of worry and fear. In Adam, we don't feel like we have purpose in Adam, we don't have hope. But in Christ, we have, we have authority. We have new life. We have joy. We have all of these things in Jesus. And what Paul is talking about is the uh, doctrine. I'm going to get a little theological here, but the doctrine of identification. In other words, just as Jesus died, we died. Not that we will die, but we already died to sin. Just like Jesus was buried we were buried too. Why? Because we're in Christ. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too are raised from the dead. Let me show this to you in a, in, in a, in a graphic here. Romans chapter 3 through 5 
talks about the, the doctrine of substitution. In other words, Jesus died for me. He paid sin's penalty for me. Justification, we, talk, we talked about that. Righteousness was imputed, in other words, put into our account by faith. And this is where a lot of us end. I'll just speak for myself. I feel like I have a good understanding of, being, uh, of, of the doctrine of, being, of what Jesus did for me, substitution. But here's the revelation of how to, live a, how, how to live the life and break the cycle of sin, the life that God has called us to live, is to begin to understand the doctrine of identification. In other words, Jesus didn't just die for me. Die for me. In Christ, I died with him. He didn't just break, pay sin's penalty for me. He broke sin's power over my life. Why? Because a dead man can't be tempted with sin. They, he broke it. I've died with him. In Romans 3, we see justification. Righteousness has been imputed into my account. But Romans 6 or 8, we're going to see sanctification. Righteousness is imparted. In other words, I have the power to live a life free from the bondage of sin over me. So that's your address in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 says this, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Watch this, watch this together. Watch the tense of this. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse 6. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Notice. Everything that he says here in this passage is past tense. He loved us. He made us alive. We have been saved. He has raised us up. He has seated us. In other words, it's already done. So I want to tell somebody, you, you in Christ is not something you have to strive to someday become. It's something you already have because you are now in Christ Jesus and that's your identity. That's your address. You're no longer in Adam. You're no longer in sin. You're no longer defined by your last name or what street you grew up on or your history. Now you have a destiny in Christ Jesus that you've been raised from the dead. You've been, you, you've been raised to life. Sin's power is broken over you. That is your identity. That's who you are. So whenever the package comes to your door and it's not, it's, it's, it's to the wrong address, you say, no, 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 that may be who I used to be. When sin tries to knock on the door and to, to bring temptation to you, you say, okay, that may have been who I used to be, but I don't live there anymore. I remember my address. My kids right now are in school remembering their address. I remember as a kid, I can remember most of the addresses that I used to live at because it's just kind of burned in your memory. You need to, see, see, that's the danger of it. You can remember the past a lot more than you remember where you are. You ever had this happen? You remember your old phone number, but you don't remember your current phone number? That's me. I remember my childhood phone number, but I gotta look it up sometimes to remember my own number right now. You know, the danger is we do that with the Lord. We remember our past better than we remember our position in Jesus Christ, and that's what Paul's trying to burn into our minds. Remember your address. Here's a second way that we battle sin. We need to renounce agreement with the enemy. That's just powerful. Could you say that with me? Renounce agreement with the enemy. See, a lot of times when it comes to these uh, just uh, besetting temptations and sins that, that we all struggle with from time to time, if, if we don't watch it, there will be an agreement that we make with the devil. We, we will, there are things that have been said over us. There are thoughts that come into our minds. We will just make an agreement to say that's who we are. Verse 6 of Romans 6 says this. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin may be brought to nothing. We're going to talk about that in a moment. So that we will no longer be enslaved to sin. We know. That's what he starts by saying. We know know that our old self was crucified. That the first thing in the step of renouncing the, the agreements that we've made with the enemy is a knowledge of who we are in Christ. We know we've died with Christ. And there are just lies that come up in our heart and mind. I put this 
um, in, in your notes just some different, a list of lies that we can believe, that we can believe, well, I'm unworthy. It's an agreement with the enemy. You know what? If you knew my past, if you knew what I've been through, God can never use me. I'm unworthy. I, I've, maybe you've had an opportunity to serve God in the past and then it, you, you made a mistake and then ever since that day, you have agreed with the enemy, I'm unworthy. I'll never be used by God. God will never have a, I'll, I'll never have a place in his kingdom. Maybe this one, I'm not free. I'm not free, I'm always bound. I'll forever be bound by this addiction. I'll be forever be bound by my past. What about this? I can't beat this. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. I guess this is just how I'm always gonna be. Or maybe this one, it's just the way I am. I was born this way. I'll say this, that may be the way you were born, but now you've been born again. That's not who you are. That's not who you are. It's just the way that I am. Or about this one, I'll never get better. Things will just never get better in my life. Things are never going to get better in my family. Things are never going to get better in my future. What about this one? I can't change. I can't change. Am I really accepted? People really accept me? Does, and, th- and that really goes to a higher question. Does God really accept me? This one, am I even saved? It's an agreement that we have with the enemy in our lives along the way. This is so important to to truly understand what's happening and to renounce some of these lies. And I could go on and on. We could all add our lies to that list. And I just want to ask the question, what lie is Satan trying to bring up in your mind? It's a little bit of a review from last week. But what lie of the enemy are you agreeing with in your life? And what do you need to renounce in Jesus' name today? Because you're no longer who you used to be. You've been crucified with Christ, and now you have a new identity in Jesus Christ. What area are you agreeing with an old lie from the, from the devil that you need to rise up and say, no, no, this is who I am in Christ? Because the danger is if we don't begin to understand the enemy's attack in our life, we will start misrepresenting, we'll start mis, uh, we, we'll misunderstand what's actually happening when we are tempted and when we sin. And this was so powerful to me. What actually is happening when we sin? What Paul says here is that he uses this phrase, that the body of sin will be brought to nothing. What's he talking about there? He's talking about our body. He's talking about our body. So, in other words, there are things that happen to us. We, we, we may be a new person, but we didn't get a new body yet. One day in heaven we will. That's, it won't be tempted. But what Paul is saying is that even though your spirit is alive, it has a new address, new location, your body is still going to be subject to wanting to sin. Your body is still going to be subject to, to, to lust or your, your mind, your, your mouth, the gossip, your attitude, your feet, your hands, uh, We can all have this body of sin that we're tempted by, that we're wanting to change, but we don't feel like we can change. It's this wrestling match with the body of sin. And what Satan tries to do is he tries to lie to us and say, well, if you're tempted to sin, you must not even be saved. You must not even love God. A lot of Christians, when dealing with sin or repetitive sin, a lot of times in those areas where sin gets a foothold in our body, we start really questioning ourselves, am I even saved? And I want to say this, it's spiritually destructive to doubt your salvation every time you struggle with sin. And if you grew up uh, like I did in a holiness type movement, I think the intentions were probably the best of intentions um, to, to live, if you know what, if you grew up in a holiness movement, you know what I'm talking about, because there would be these extra rules that would be added to what it would mean to serve the Lord in an effort to say it really does matter that you live a righteous life. But the danger of it is it so destabilizes a believer's heart when they make a mistake that they constantly wonder if they're even saved every time they make a mistake. And the truth is, it's just that body of sin that needs to be put in its place and reminded of who we really are in Christ Jesus. It's because the danger is, is that, and this is how I live most of my life, is that whenever you make a mistake, you feel like you go back to ground zero again with God. 
And you got to say, okay, I'm going to take the next few months and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try harder and I'm going to do more. And maybe you, maybe you uh, are able to say no to that thing for, for a little bit and then you make a mistake again. And what you do, you go back to ground zero again. And the enemy's constantly lying to you and you're never able to get beyond it because he keeps you in a rut of besetting sin. I don't know if I'm speaking to anybody, maybe just to myself. But I want to remind somebody today to renounce your agreement with the enemy and say, you know what? That may have been what my body did, but my spirit's been redeemed and God's doing a work in my life and that doesn't stop what God's doing. It's a different message. <laughs> so the question is, what do you do? Okay, let's go to verse, verse seven, verse seven. For the one who has died has been set free to sin. That's us, we're set free to sin, from sin. Verse eight, now if we have died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. Verse nine, we know that, in, that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Watch this, once and for all. So, so every time you sin, Jesus is not going back to the cross. He died once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That word is so powerful. Consider yourself dead to sin. In other words, keep it top of your mind. I'm dead to sin and I'm alive to God. And so here's what happens. Whenever we, when, when you begin to grasp this doctrine and you fall into sin, you make a mistake, um, you'll stop asking the question, am I even saved? And you'll say something more like this. I put it on the screen just so you could see it. You'd say this whenever you fall into sin, of course I'm saved. I'm justified. My old man was crucified. I'm a new person in Christ. I'm accepted by God. And nothing I can do can change that. This sin I have allowed cannot separate me from God. Why did I sin? I sin because of this body of sin, this body of sin. However, someday God's gonna redeem it and give me a glorified body. The presence of this sin does not invalidate my salvation, but it certainly inconsistent with my salvation. It's certainly inconsistent with my salvation. Why? For I've died to sin. How can I live in it any longer? I don't want to. I repent. I surrender. I'm dead to sin. I'm alive to God. That's what it looks like when you fall into sin. Come on. You're getting this. Instead of saying, oh, you gotta do all these things and you need to, it's a list of rules. No, no, no. You need to remind yourself of your identity in Christ and what that will do will rise up in you a desire to say, I don't want to live in sin. I don't wanna live this way anymore. I want to serve Jesus with all my heart and with all my life. Consider, keep it ever before you. Don't see sanctification as something that's just some list of rules. To, to live by, and if you do this, if you do that, that, then you become spiritually mature. I put this on your note, in your notes. When a list of rules becomes the tools of discipleship, legalism is always the result. If the way that you grow in Christ is some list that someone wrote somewhere other than the Bible, other than in Christ, other than who we are in Christ, then it's just going to be legalistic. I put this in your notes as well. Keeping the fact that we've died to sin in our minds is the beginning to experiencing God's power in overcoming sin in our daily lives. Every day, remind yourself, I'm dead to sin. When you're tempted, I'm dead to sin. That's not who I am anymore. I'm dead to that old way of life. I renounce the agreement that I've had with the enemy. I'm a child of God. I'm in Christ Jesus. I died to sin. I have a brand new identity. Are you even saved? What do you mean? Am I saved? I'm saved because of what Jesus did for me. I've received abundant grace. I've received righteousness in Christ. You know what? This is not gonna keep me. Devil, you should have never tempted me with this. There's a boldness that starts rising up within you when you start realizing who you are in Jesus Christ. So remember that your address, you're in Christ now. Recognize you're free. In other words, renounce the agreement that you've had with the enemy. And number three, the way that we battle sin is refuse to be an instrument for sin. Refuse to be an instrument for sin. Verse 12 says this, let not, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. 
The word passion there is epe. It just means uncontrollable desires. In other words, you may be dead to sin, but you won't be dead to temptation. Jesus was dead to sin, but Jesus was tempted by the enemy. Tempted to to, to obey sin's passions. And the truth is, although sin cannot dominate the Christian's being, Sin can surely dominate our bodies and our minds. And maybe you're here today and you think, Brandon, I wish I would have heard this message a long time ago because I got a lot of regret, a lot of things I wish I would have done differently. I wish I would have realized who I am in Jesus Christ. What do you do? I want to encourage you, just keep reminding yourself of who you are in Christ Jesus. What the devil meant for evil, God can turn it and use it for good. Get people around you. Get a group of people around you. Get a small group to remind you of who you are in Jesus Christ. And don't let sin reign one more day in your mind. Verse 13, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. There it is. But present yourselves to God as those who have been bought, brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. I got thinking about that verse about an instrument. And how when I was 12 years old, I got um, an instrument, a guitar, for Christmas. And I started a loving instrument. But I, I didn't use this instrument for the Lord for a long time. Uh, my first song I ever learned to play was a. Somebody never thought they'd hear Nirvana at church. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, don't clap for that. Don't clap for that. <laughs> If we play that at home and the kids just turn into WrestleMania, you know, they just get to. <laughs> but, you know, this instrument is powerful. It takes skill uh, and just a lot of time to play it, to, time to, to learn uh, to play, a lot of practice. But the truth is it can be used for anything. This, this instrument's not good or bad. It's just an instrument. And uh, what Paul's saying is he's not saying your body is bad. He's just saying... Your body is an instrument. And he really asked the question, who's playing your instrument? See, Satan wants to play you like a guitar. Or if I'm from the country, he wants to play you like a fiddle. (laughs) And he knows. You ever had the enemy play you like a fiddle? Come on. He knows if the money gets tight in this area, you're going to do this. You're going to stop being faithful with giving. It's going to say, yeah played them not realizing God was going to be faithful through it all you just keep being faithful in your generosity maybe it's like you know what if you get your you you know husband and wife getting a fight a little disagreement then the enemy knows he can he can tempt you with lust he can he can play you like a fiddle what Paul's trying to say is open your eyes you are not an instrument for sin you're an instrument for God you and here's the awesome thing. We all are, we all are different. We, 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 all, we, all, we all sound different. We, all, we are a unique instrument. We're all individuals. God's created us all individually. And that's why the enemy wants to fight over. That's why he wants to keep you addicted and keep you bound and keep you in sin. Why? Because he wants to use your instrument for his song. But what the scripture says is that you can take that same instrument and you can present it to God as an instrument of his righteousness and it can actually be a blessing like it can actually bring glory to God and you can, you can sing songs that draw other people into worshiping God and I was thinking that's just kind of the power of what it means to serve the Lord so every day the question is what are we presenting Who are we giving our lives to? Because if we're not intentionally giving our lives to the Lord, we may very well be intentionally using our our instruments for the wrong kingdom. So what do we do every day? Wake up and say, God, I give this instrument to you. I give you my mouth. 
Ooh, I give you my fingers as I type on Facebook. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I, give you my, I give you my eyes. I'm not going to look at anything that's not pleasing to you. I give you my mouth. I give you my feet. I'm not going anywhere that's not going to bring you glory. God, I give you every aspect of who I am. Take my life. Take my body. Take my mind. And God, it's an instrument to you. And here's the awesome thing. As you start playing, it actually starts being a beautiful song whenever you play your own. But it, if the band asked them to help me with this. But whenever you start, every person starts using their instrument and joins with mine. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, drums and bass, let's sing it, let's play it together. Then we can even bring the voices. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you. Why don't you all join with me? Oh God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Rock of ages. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness. That's the power of an instrument. You say, well, Brandon, that's great. I wish I could sing. You're like, you don't want to hear my instrument, trust me. You know what? You have an instrument given by God. You have something you can do. I I just have to share this. This is so powerful. So something that's brand new here at City Hills is um, a ministry for... um, to love and care for uh, children in our community that have special needs. It's called the Oasis. And you may have not even known it existed, but um, Pastor Jake and Pastor Derek and Ashley, the, the Next Gen team has just had a heart for this. And uh, last, and, and then people have been coming to City Hills with, with the background of being able to care for uh, kids with, with struggles and to be able to love on families like this. And last week, there were eight um, kids that were ministered to last week um, in what we call the Oasis. It's the Oasis ministry. And um, Lori Ann, you're here. This is actually from Lori Ann. I didn't know she was going to be singing today. But Lori Ann uh, leads that team. And she wrote a note to her team. And I took out anything that would be personal, but here's what she said from last Sunday. Good morning, team. Thank you to everyone who helped out yesterday. I do have an amazing story. We had a new child that came yesterday. The child struggles with being separated from his parents. And because of that, they've not been able to attend a church service in person in years. Well, because of your serving, mom and dad were able to attend the whole service today. After service, one of, those, one of the child's parents came in and hugged me with tears in their eyes. Just saying, thank you for this team. You guys are rock stars. Thank you for loving on these awesome kiddos. What's that? It's just somebody using an instrument. What song would our city hear if all of us together say, God, we're not going to stay stuck in this cycle of sin anymore. No, I don't even live there anymore. I'm a instrument for God to use however he wants me to use it. My life is not my own. It's not about me. I'm an instrument to be used by God to do whatever he wants to do in my life. So God, use my hands, use my feet, use my professional training, use my money and resources, use my time, use my past, use my present, use my future. All of my life is for your glory. I'm no longer an instrument of sin. I'm an instrument to be used by God. And what a sound, what a sound. For verse 14, let me conclude with this. He says, for sin will no longer have dominion over you since you are no longer under law, 
but under grace. Here's the last thing I wanted to say. Church, we need to rejoice that we are under the grace of God. And we need to sing the song to our, to our world, to our city, to our community of what Jesus has done in our lives. Why don't we do that one more time? Let's sing this song together all over the house. And why don't we just lift up our hands as a sign to say, God, you can use my instrument for your glory, for my life, for, my, for everything that I have. Before we, before we do that, I just want to say in this, in this moment, if you're here and you want to give your life to Jesus... We're going to sing one more time in just a moment. But if you're here and you want to surrender your life to the Lord, I would love to lead you in just a prayer to have a fresh start with God today. And if that's you, whether you're here in the room or joining us online, I invite you to pray this prayer with me today. Have a fresh start with God. Let's pray this together. Say, Jesus, I surrender to you. My whole life, change me. Save me. I'm turning around. I'm making a fresh start today. Use me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. My whole life is yours from this moment forward. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place. Can we give God a hand clap of praise today?